Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today, we're going to be answering the age-old question, Harry Potter vs Hermione Granger, who is more powerful? I'm sure you've thought about that matchup a time or two, but did you ever decide who was the greater practitioner of magic? On one side, you have the boy who lived, the boy who would eventually kill the greatest dark wizard of all time, and on the other, you have the smartest witch of her generation and someone so tenacious that she saved Harry's life through sheer studying and willpower time and time again. Today, we're going to compare the two and see who really was the better witch or wizard between them. Magical Feats When we look at magical feats, there's no shortage of accomplishments shared between Harry Potter and Hermione Granger. In fact, some of their most impressive deeds occurred while they were fighting shoulder to shoulder, taking out Death Eaters on their path to defeating Lord Voldemort. But we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't try to separate Harry's feats from Hermione's and see whose were greater. We'll start with Harry, and to be honest, it's hard to sum up just how much the Potter boy achieved. His seven years at Hogwarts were filled with horrible fights against dark wizards, terrifying nights in the Forbidden Forest, and over a dozen battles against deadly beasts. But if we try to narrow our focus and choose a handful of Harry's most astounding accomplishments, these few are the ones that simply can't be ignored. One of Harry's most overlooked powers was his ability to not only cast a Patronus, but also to make it corporeal. For most book readers and moviegoers, the Patronus spell might seem like it's rather weak. After all, it doesn't cause any outright physical harm, like the Sectum Sempra that Severus Snape developed, or the Incarcerous spell that Dolores Umbridge used against the Centaurs. But the Patronus is actually one of the most difficult spells to master in the entire wizarding world, and conjuring the spell in the form of a corporeal beast was actually the sign of a master wizard. If we think about that fact alone, then Harry Potter is more than a gifted wizard. He's outright powerful too. But to add even more weight to his achievement, Potter cast a corporeal Patronus when he was only 13 years old, and used it to repel dozens of Dementors. Most wizards couldn't even conjure a formless Patronus, but Harry did it when he was still just a boy, and that was only the beginning for Harry. When we look at the wider breadth of his magical feats, there's something that's hard to overlook. Harry's greatest feats were in defense against the Dark Arts, and by that subject's nature, Harry learned most of what he knew through hands-on experience, fighting against Death Eaters or evil beasts, which means Harry's skills weren't limited to the classroom. Harry was chosen by the Sorting Hat to wield Godric Gryffindor's sword, and defeated Salazar Slytherin's Basilisk with it. Basilisks were among the deadliest creatures in the entire wizarding world, but at age 12, Harry managed to kill one with the very weapon that Godric Gryffindor used to duel half of Britain, whenever his opponents weren't able to wield wands. Harry was also a naturally gifted flyer. From the first moment he picked up a broomstick, until his very last days on the Quidditch pitch at Hogwarts, Harry was one of the best seekers to pass through the school. But most impressive of all was that Harry became an aura at the Ministry of Magic at such a young age. Immediately after defeating Lord Voldemort, he was awarded a job, along with many other veterans from the Battle of Hogwarts, and by the time Harry reached 26 years in age, he was given a director's position, overseeing the entire Aura Division. Now, when we turn our attention to Hermione Granger, you might be curious how this witch could compete, but Hermione was no slouch. She was often alongside Harry standing shoulder to shoulder with the Potter boy when he accomplished all of these feats, and her contributions were enormous. Unlike Harry, Hermione developed her magical skills by focusing on classwork. She often prepared weeks or months in advance of scheduled lectures, and used spells, charms, and potions inside and out. By the time Professor Snape or any other Hogwarts instructor came around to teaching a particular magical concoction or spell, Hermione was often already quite proficient at it, and that type of hard work and dedication paid off for the young witch. Time after time, her expertise with spells and potions aided Harry Potter and Ron Weasley in the group's fights against dark creatures and wizards. When hunting for Lord Voldemort's Horcruxes, Hermione demonstrated her mastery of magic by using transfiguration to augment her future husband Ron Weasley's appearance at Gringotts Bank. 
But in that one field alone, Hermione was somewhat of a master. She could change almost any household object into a magical dragon via the Draconophore spell. And in a perhaps more frightening spell, Hermione could easily change the form of objects into tiny house mice with the Snufflefore spell. Transfiguration was one of the hardest disciplines in the entire wizarding world, so Hermione's ability to cast such complex spells was a sure sign of her status as a master witch. Just like Harry Potter, Hermione was extremely talented in the defense against the dark arts. She was even able to conjure the incredibly difficult Corporeal Patronus, just like Harry, although hers took on the form of an otter. But one of the biggest differences between Hermione and her friends was her ability to concoct perfect potions. When she was just 12 years old, she managed to brew a batch of Polyjuice Potion, a liquid that would transform you into anyone you'd like. When Ron and Harry consumed the flask, their appearance flawlessly morphed into that of Crab and Goyle. But this potion wasn't a cute little magical drink that first or second years should have been fooling around with. The consequences for a failed Polyjuice batch were high, and could often result in death. If Hermione was off by just one ingredient, or mixed the knotgrass or the lace swings at the wrong time, the entire group of friends could have perished. And through the years, Hermione only got better. Just like Harry, the number of enemies Hermione faced became darker and darker, and by the time their final battle against Voldemort took place, Hermione was one of the finest witches Hogwarts had ever produced. And just like Harry, she went on to join the Auras and continue the fight against the Dark Arts at the Ministry of Magic, dueling. Now, when we were diving into Hermione and Harry's magical feats, it was hard to avoid the topic of dueling spells, because so much of their magical knowledge was learned from first-hand experience, from fighting off Death Eaters and Dark Beasts. And between the pair of them, they might have racked up more wins against Lord Voldemort's underlings than almost any other members of the Order of the Phoenix. Let's start with Hermione. As a duelist, Hermione was one of the best. Even though she was just a student at Hogwarts, Hermione was already deadlier with a wand than many adult witches. When she was only in her first and second years, Hermione had mastered the levitation charm before the other members of her class, and that was a sign of things to come. Because, unlike some of the other powerhouse duelists from her generation, Hermione liked to mix all sorts of spells together while fighting against an opponent. She could wrap a Death Eater up in a full body bind curse as easily as she could strike them with the blasting curse. Her mastery of dueling led her to defeat some of the darkest wizards and beasts under Voldemort's control. She bested the Death Eater Antonin Dolohov, hit the werewolf Fenrir Greyback hard enough to send him flying, and also scored a legit knockdown on Voldemort's Maledictus, the snake known as Nagini. But even though Hermione was no slouch, it's hard to contend with the likes of Harry Potter. The boy who lived was forced to raise his wand against some of the most prominent opponents in the wizarding world, Severus Snape, Draco Malfoy, an army of Inferi, and Lord Voldemort himself, just to name a few. But even though Harry faced off against such terrifying adversaries, he was lucky in one regard. He was a naturally gifted duelist. Remus Lupin famously marveled at Harry's skills, and when Dumbledore mentored Harry, even the wise old headmaster of Hogwarts must have wondered how much of Harry's skill was his own natural gifts and how much was inherited from Lord Voldemort, because Harry's achievements, during his youth at least, were unrivaled. Harry's go-to spell was the disarming charm, but that was just the tip of the iceberg for the young wizard. He was also dangerous with the stunning charm, impediment jinx, and even used some of Severus Snape's curses, like Sectum Sempra, which would dangerously slash at opponent's skin and could cause them to bleed out if they didn't get immediate medical attention. Harry sometimes dabbled in the dark arts, too. He utilized two of the three unforgivable curses, namely the Imperius Curse, which compelled its victim to do whatever Harry wanted, and the Cruciatus Curse, which induced immeasurable pain in its target and was often used for torture. Harry used all of these skills to best a who's who of dark wizards. He soundly defeated Corbin Yaxley, Draco Malfoy, and even Fenrir Greyback, before eventually achieving what no other wizard could, killing Lord Voldemort. If we just look at the list of Harry's victories, 
He might have been the most accomplished duelist of the entire era. Conclusion and Intangibles As you know, it's always difficult to settle a debate of who's the more powerful wizard, and this case is no different. Hermione Granger and Harry Potter were among the greatest magic users of their generation, and if either one of them had decided to join the Death Eaters and serve Lord Voldemort, the entire Second Wizarding War might have ended far worse than it did. But thankfully, their lack of ego allowed the two to become friends, and work together in order to rid the world of Tom Riddle's evil. So if we try to decide who was greater between the two, who would you choose? Harry had the longer list of dueling opponents and was more skilled in defense against the Dark Arts. His strange connection to Lord Voldemort also bestowed upon him particular skills that only a true Slytherin heir would possess, and Harry's greatest intangible, the love that his mother passed to him by her sacrifice, seemed to have empowered Harry throughout his years. We also can't ignore the fact that Harry got lucky very often, almost as if he had an IV of liquid luck running through his veins. By comparison, Hermione Granger's own incredible record just doesn't stack up, and even though she would undoubtedly try her best to defeat any opponent, could her dedication to studying and preparation be enough to contend with Harry? It's a tough call, but I think that despite Harry's accomplishments, Hermione still edges him out on raw magical ability. But that's just me. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below, and let me know why you made the decision that you did. If you like these versus videos, I've also done Voldemort vs Grindelwald, Snape vs McGonagall, and Sirius vs Umbridge. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live.